Come on, let's go to God with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank and praise you for this, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Lord, we thank you that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. Lord, I thank you that you are the one doing the speaking. You are the one doing the thinking. You are the one doing the ministry, Holy Spirit. And we prepare ourselves and we are prepared to receive all that you have on today. May it be none of me and all of you. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise one more time. You may be seated. Amen. Well, we've been having a good time uh, on this series, We Are the Righteous. And um, right now we're talking about the fact that right ruling is really not separate from right living. As a matter of fact, if you want to live right as a believer, it is all about ruling. Amen? Somebody say, I'm a ruler. Amen. So right living in, indeed is right ruling, but we talked about the fact that there are four things that are going to be required if we are going to rule in this earth. And we talked about the first one on uh, Sunday, and that number one thing is to rule requires maturity. Amen? Now, we talked about the fact that um, maturity is about growing in the things of God to the point that we can actually listen to the Holy Spirit and do what he says. Amen? Uh, the Bible talks about the fact that before we were saved, we were indeed dead to sin, or dead in sin, sorry. We were dead in sin, and so we were slaves to sin. Amen? Now, I know, you know, that word is a sensitive word, especially amongst our black community, but I don't want you guys to be afraid of that word or throw up crosses at that word and this, that, and the other. Uh, we're just saying what the Bible says. Amen? Amen? As a matter of fact, I was thinking about this, and I was just thinking about those of us, if you're like me, I was raised in the North, and so, especially when Black History Month came around, uh, we spent a lot of time, you know, uh, learning about slavery and learning about uh, the progress of the African American community, and we always had the plays and the skits and the this, that, and the other. And actually, I thought, you know, growing up in Detroit, that that same history uh, was shared all around our nation at that same level until I met my wife, Melissa, who, as many of you guys know, is Hispanic and here from uh, Texas, uh, Houston in particular, and she shared with me that, you know, that they didn't necessarily go in on it like we did. So there were a lot of things she didn't kind of know, you know, uh, not because she didn't want to know, but it just wasn't taught. Um, but again, if you're from up north especially, uh, there's a lot that we, we learn about slavery and what it is. And it's funny, it's hard to read these scriptures without paralleling the two uh, and, and thinking about slavery, slavery from the uh, early years of America uh, to being a slave or in bondage to sin, uh, they're still quite similar as a bottom line. I mean, a slave has really no rights. A slave is at the mercy of their master. Isn't that true? I mean, just think, just think about all the pictures you've seen, the movies you've seen, the stuff you've heard about just African-American uh, slavery. And then think about being a slave to sin, the, the abuse, the mistreatment. Uh, no one wants the life of a slave. Amen? And then think about God who is love, who set the captives free, through Jesus. Think about the fact that he saved us from this life of being slaves to sin. How many of you guys know that's good news? I, I would dare say that your day of salvation is equivalent to like the Juneteenth that we just celebrated, uh, you know, uh, here, especially in Texas. And for those who don't know, that's the day that uh, slavery was already, had already happened. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, freedom from slavery had uh, Emancipation Proclamation had already gone out from Abraham Lincoln, but it didn't get to the South as fast as it did everywhere else. So as the, as the uh, story goes, I forgot the guy's name, but he came to uh, Galveston uh, via boat and then let the slaves in Texas know that, hey, you're free, but it was like two years after the Emancipation Proclamation had actually been given, and as the story goes, it happened on June 19th. 
So many uh, African Americans celebrate June 19th as the actual day that they or we received independence. When you get saved, it is your independence day from sin. It is your independence day from bondage. It is your independence day from being held captive to a life without God and connected to him. Your day of salvation is a good day. I said your day of salvation is a good day. That's the day you were free. That's the day Jesus set you free. So when we see this word being a slave in the Bible, I don't want you to necessarily, you know, cringe at it or whatever like that. It's saying exactly what it is that was going on. We were captive because of the act of Adam in the garden. When Adam fell, the man fell, and all of man became slaves to sin. But thank God for the gospel of grace. Thank God for Jesus, the word. Thank God for Jesus, the truth that came along and set us free. And as it goes, if we believe in what he did, we are no longer slaves, but we are now children of God. Being a child means I have rights. Being a child means I am adopted in and grafted in. Being a child means that now uh, what the owner has is now mine as well. If you understand that so far, say amen. amen. Now you got to be a little careful though because being a child means I'm an heir, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm an operating heir. Why? Because as we covered on Sunday, you're still a child. And how many of you guys know you don't give child, children run of the house? You don't, you don't let them get keys to the car. Amen? So it's yours when you're able to handle it. If you understand that, say amen. So while we are inheritance of God and while we are heirs of God, and, and, and I'm saying that on purpose that way because Again, we've been taught so much that we are beneath who we actually are. I've actually heard people say we're heirs of Jesus, and that's actually incorrect. The Bible says we're co-heirs with Christ. What does it mean to be a co-heir? It means we are equally inheriting the same thing. So Jesus is my brother, and I am a co-heir with him, a co-heir of what? of everything our Father has. See, that's totally different than, oh, the way it goes is it's God, it's Jesus, then it's me. This whole message is about it's God and it's you and Jesus. I'm going to say that again. It's God, and then it's not like it's Jesus over here and then it's me. No, 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 we, we read the scripture that said we are united with him. So it is now, it used to be God and then Jesus and then us, but now it's God and then us and Jesus as one. We have been united specifically with Christ. If you understand that, say amen. amen. So now I want you just to pause and think about that for a second with me. Do you recall how Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John used to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to follow the will of the Father? You remember whenever Jesus would do ministry and everything like that? Uh, we looked at it uh, a little closely when we were talking about how, how do we get away and how do we spend time to charge up and everything. And I gave you all those scriptures that show Jesus would get up, he would go away by lakes, he would go off at mountains, and he would just go and spend time with God. And then when it became time for ministry, he would work with the Holy Spirit, listening to whatever God told him to do, and he did it. Listening to whatever God told him to say, and he said it. So you had God speaking directly with Jesus, operating with the Holy Spirit who was on the inside of him, and that's how he got things done on earth. If you understand that, say amen. So now that I'm united with Christ and I'm physically the one still here on earth, how would I expect that I should be operating on earth the same way Jesus did? It's God, 
not trying to operate through Jesus alone and then through me because I'm united with Christ. So God is going to speak directly to the Holy Spirit on the inside of me just like he did Jesus. And because I am now sealed and stamped uh, with the same rights as what Jesus has because Christ is on the inside of me, he can speak to me the same way he did Jesus. He can operate with me the same way he did Jesus. Not only can he, he wants to. Not only does he want to, that's the only way it gets done. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There is no other way to commune with God. There is no other way to operate with God than the way Jesus did. There's not some other way that we need to discover. All we need to do is look at the life of Jesus, and the way he did it, that's how we do it. It's not, it's not any deeper than that. Jesus got away, and he prayed, and he spent time with the Father. And then he, re he relied on the Holy Spirit to get everything done. Paul comes along and basically says the same thing. And he's always pointing back to Jesus, always pointing back to Christ. But again, because of not so good teaching overall and over, t sorry, over time, we've been looking at the wrong person in the story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've been looking at the sinner. We've been looking at the sick person. We've been looking at the broke person. We've been looking at the people, uh, as we've been talking about, at the feet of Jesus and not the people who were, who, who, the person who was sitting in the, the, the seat of authority who was Jesus. You're the Jesus in the story. You're not the woman with the issue of blood. You're not the, the guy who's possessed with demons. You're not the guy who uh, needs God to come and heal one of his kids. You, that's not who you are. You're not, who was the guy up in the tree, uh, Zacchaeus? You're not Zacchaeus. You're not, you're not these, those folks who didn't have Christ on the inside. You have everything he has to offer. Say that with me. Say, I have all of Christ, all of his power, all of his wisdom, all of his anointing on the inside of me. He is united with me, and we have the Holy Spirit empowering us. And then, then you got to stop and really think about that. You got to stop and really meditate on that. And it will start to change your viewpoint. You're no longer at the feet, you're in the seat, and the view is different from up there. How's the view? That's what I need to be asking you tonight. How's the view? Because if you're still seeing things from down here versus from up there in the seat, it looks totally different from down there. How many of you guys have been in an airplane before? And then, and then you looked out the window. Don't things look totally different? You, you fly over a Target, you fly over a Walmart, and you see, every, you see all the top of everything and everything like that, and there's a whole other perspective from up there than from when you're walking in that store or on the ground. Rulers see things totally different. Rulers see big picture. Rulers see truth for what it is. I know that was a lot I just said in that, if you're writing that down. But rulers see things for what it is. And, and, and rulers don't sweat the small stuff. Think about, again, flying in that plane and seeing things from that top perspective. You don't see all the little detail stuff that's going on down there, do you? There could be, and I'm so sorry to say this, but there could be a cat getting ran over or something like that. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know, would you? Why? Because you can't see it. You're not concerned about it because you can't see it. And, and I, I kind of wonder if we find ourselves concerned about things that we can see because we're not looking at things from the proper vantage point. I believe that there are certain things we're not even supposed to be looking at. Sickness comes in. That ain't, I, can't, I can't even pay no attention to that. I can't pay no attention to that. I can't go by what I'm seeing in that sense, so I'm not going to even put my eyes on that no more. Because if I put my eyes on it and start paying attention to it, even that statement, paying attention, you're, you're, you're giving it attention, will cause you to now respond to what you see. And whenever you start responding to what you see, guess what? You're not in faith. Because according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things 
hoped for or expected. It's the evidence of stuff you don't see. So I'm not even supposed to be looking at that stuff. Sickness, poverty, lack, brokenness, any of those things, that's not for rulers to pay attention to. Why? Because that don't apply to me. I'm a king. I'm a queen. I have no lack. My God has supplied all my needs according to his riches in glory. I'll say that, Holy Spirit. I'm not seeking for him to do these things. I have sought him, and now I have found him, and it's done. I remember that was a popular thing not too long ago, and it still may be about, you know, uh, you know, you want to have a church that's a, that's a seeker friendly and we want to be seeker friendly, but I'm telling you as mature believers, I want to be seeing friendly. I want to take the K out and I want you to see him. And so you can see yourself as you are. You were seeking him all this time and now you found him and found the truth of who you are. So you don't have to keep seeking. You found. And as a finder, now what you need to do is live as a believer. Believe in what you now see in the truth of his word. But don't believe as if you're still seeking. Because that's what many people do. We believe and then we say, I believe, I believe God's going to do it. And then you're looking for it. No, no, no. Believers believe it and therefore it's done. Believers believe it and therefore it is is finished it is done yeah but but i uh but when it's gonna come into the natural when you believe it in the spirit when you believe what the holy spirit is telling you that is the connection point and your confessions your actions all that you do in the natural simply should back up what you already know to be true but all of this that I'm talking about, it requires maturity. Remember what we said before, if there's a struggle in our life, um, it's, it's only still there because we're allowing it to be there. I know that's hard, but, but that goes to, the, uh, to I think, a, a subcategory I had on uh, this number one uh, one, which was to rule requires maturity, is that we have the responsibility. We have the responsibility. Not just for our lives, but we have the responsibility to show God's love in this earth. Amen? But if I have sickness happening in my household, if I have sickness happening in my life, it is now my responsibility to declare the word of God. Amen? Amen? Now, it's finished. It's done. I'm not the one responsible for the healing. That's God's job. I'm responsible for believing that it's done. Amen? Amen? But if I don't believe that it's done and I'm walking in unbelief, then guess what? I'll never see the manifestation because I don't believe. Does that make sense? So all this time we've been thinking that I got I to gotta give and I got to confess and I got to come to church and I got to do all this stuff so that the healing will happen. No, you just need to believe it's done. The good fight of faith is convincing yourself that it's done. That's the good fight of faith you're supposed to be fighting. Somebody, I'm going in spiritual warfare because I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. No, it, then, what you're doing is you're going into spiritual warfare to convince yourself that it's finished. You, you're, you're, you're trying to convince that mind. You're trying to renew that mind. You're trying to switch that other, uh, flip that other switch off that it is done. Your marriage is whole. Your kids walk in the favor of God. You have more than enough money to do all that God has called you to do and all that you desire to do. Because your desires line up with his call and his will for your life. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's where Christ dwells and therefore no sickness can't no sickness, not cancer, not STDs, not whatever else. It can't live there. Your mind is secure 
And it's like Christ. There is no depression. There is no fear and doubt. These are the things that believers say out their mouths. Not because they're trying to seek God to get it to happen. They have sought him and they have understood that it's done. And so now that they've found the truth, they're now just declaring the truth. This is how we rule, starting with us. If you understand this, say amen. So the rule absolutely requires maturity. And I have to now take responsibility for my life and then for the lives of those that God brings me into contact with. Go with me to Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 19. We'll look at this in the Amplified. Romans 8, 19 in the Amplified. How many of you are excited to be rulers? Amen. Amen. I heard somebody was saying at, uh, I don't know if it's a women's uh, event. I think that's where it was said at. But uh, somebody was saying, you know, I just never knew I could be uh, seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. I mean, I, I, I don't know if, if many of us have ever seen ourselves that way. But that is where you are. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 19 says, For even the whole creation, this is interesting. That's not just talking about man and, and woman. That's the whole creation, the whole world that was made. That's nature. That's everywhere. It says all nature. Waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known. Hmm. Did you know you have power over the wind and the waves? You have power over the hurricanes. Hurricane Dorian can't stand against the power of God. Hurricane Dorian can't stand against the children of God. See, but you got to make up your mind that you're going to be mature rulers, amen? Not just children who have an inheritance, but I am a mature ruler. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm free. I'm a child of God. But I can't stop it just being a child of God who has an inheritance. I now have to be a ruler who is mature. And a ruler who is mature knows how to operate in their rights. You have a right to speak to that storm. It's waiting to come in line with the will of God. It is not God's will for, for people to die in a, in a storm or whatever like that. But, 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 but the sons and the daughters of God have to wake up and stand up and be who they are. As a matter of fact, we speak to that storm in Jesus' name and we declare and decree right now, Father, that your will is the will that's going to be, not the will of nature or the enemy or anything like that. So we declare right now safety for people and property on that coast in Puerto Rico and in the islands. And we just give you all the glory, honor, and praise. And we speak to that storm and we say, peace be still in Jesus' name. And see, and then the question is, is, are you following God's will? Are you following his way? Are you following his direction in what you say and when you say it? And then when you do, do you even believe it? Amen? Now again, you got to remember what Jesus said. He said, I'm only saying what the Father says, and I'm only going where the Father tells me to go, and I'm only doing what the Father tells me to do. We dare not try to then play God and take our power and misuse it or attempt to misuse it because if you attempt to misuse the power you're just going to find out you ain't got no power because you've unplugged from the source it's like a vacuum cleaner that runs away out of your hand or something like that and it unplugs from the wall it's still a vacuum cleaner but it ain't on no more and if you get away and get unplugged from your source then don't be surprised if you start commanding this and commanding that and ain't nothing happening amen because our source, even with all the rights that we have, is still God. Amen. Uh, it says, 
whole creation, all nature, waits expectantly, longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known, waits for, uh, let's keep going, waits for the revealing and the disclosing of their sonship. And that whole sentence, that last sentence is all about identity, about us knowing who we are. The, the, the world is waiting for us to figure out who we are. Do you see that? The world is waiting for us to figure out who we are and then to believe it, and then it's not just enough to then say, oh, I finally figured out who I, I am. Then we have to operate in it. We have to operate in it. And all of that requires maturity. Amen? You can't be embarrassed of who you are. You can't worry about what mama and them are going to say. You know, I, 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 um, in the natural, I hesitated getting this deep into this particular topic because to start talking to people about you're no longer at the feet, you know, you're in the seat, you know, some people didn't like that. Wait a minute, what are you talking about? I can't be at the feet of Jesus. I was raised at the feet of Jesus. I worship at the feet of Jesus. I, I, I pray at the feet of Jesus. And I'm like, please show me where it says that in the word for a believer. There was a bunch of people who wasn't saved, who, who needed what he had because he was physically on the earth and they had to receive from him. But he now lives in you. So how are you at his, how, how does that work? Show me, show me Paul at the feet. I, I, I don't think there's a scripture that says that. But that's what's happened is, is we've taken the word and we've, we've found neat things and, and really the way you're supposed to be getting charged up and filled up is the, like we said earlier, the way Jesus did. You go off and get with the Father. You go off and get with the Holy Spirit. Let him fill you up. It's the same thing as what you were saying, you just had it wrong. And the danger in having it that other way is you start seeing Jesus as your source instead of seeing Jesus as your mirror. God's your source. Jesus, you're, 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 you're with him. So all of a sudden, you're trying to get power from Jesus and your power comes from God. Jesus is like, I'm not, I'm not your power source. I'm your savior, I'm your deliverer, I'm your healer, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the one who did all of that. I'm your advocate, but your power comes from God. And all of a sudden you start changing the way you think about your relationship with Jesus and it's not that you look down on him, because he ain't under you, but you start looking at him and you appreciate him for what he's did. It's like a big brother who took up for you in a fight. And he was getting your butt whooped. And he showed up out of nowhere and he whooped everybody. And you start appreciating him from that standpoint saying, thank you, because I was getting my butt kicked. I couldn't have did it, but now you saved me. And then all of a sudden, you and he become one and you grow and all of a sudden you got the strength that he had. You got the ability to fight the way your, your big brother fought and everything like that, and it happened instantaneously. And it's not that you don't need him anymore, uh, he's forever in you and with you. So you have him and you have his ability. But now, you gotta make up your mind that you are who you are now. You have to make up your mind that you are this new you. Because some of us, we got all the muscles, we got all the ability, we can fight the battles, we can do the things that needs to be done because he's already won them, by the way. But we're still looking for him to show up like he did that one time and save me again. Oh, they said they're going to turn my lights off. Show up, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? He's already done it. He's like, wait, 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 wait. You, you, you need to look in the mirror. You need to look in the mirror. You, you, you're still seeing the old weak you. you, you you're, you're operating with, as the little faith version of you. You gotta, when you look in that mirror of the word, by the way, what you're gonna do is you're gonna see me. You're gonna see my ability, you're gonna see my might. And when, you, you, know, you, you know what I look like, but, but now you're looking in the mirror, you're just seeing you. You're looking in the word and you're misidentifying yourself. 
You're seeing yourself as the weak person, as the broken person. No, you're me. Because I'm in you. I don't know who this is for, but take it. He said, you're, you're me. And so look in the mirror of the word. See me in you and start walking like we are. But that takes maturity. And that also takes number two, which is what we're talking about tonight. It takes a change of attitude. Your attitude, if you're going to be a ruler and live right on this earth, and remember, right living is right ruling. We have to change the position of our thinking. Amen? So, what is attitude? Attitude is a settled way of thinking. Attitude is a settled way of thinking or feeling. This is the dictionary's version. Of, about someone or something. Attitude is a set of way of thinking or feeling about someone or something. This is a long definition. Typically, one that is reflected, this is important, in a person's behavior. Attitude is a settled, somebody say settled. What does it mean when, 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 when uh, you shake up, imagine dirt being in the water, you shake it up and that water gets cloudy, and then imagine when the dust and the dirt finally settles, the picture's clear, right? What you, what you, the water's clear, right? You can see straight through it. Attitude is a settled way of thinking. All the gunk has settled down, and when it's all said and done, this is what I think. Or a better way of saying it is, this is what I believe. So attitude is a settled way of thinking about someone or something, typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. I know your attitude based on how you act. I know your attitude based on how you talk. Attitude is a position of the body proper to or implying an action or mental state. I'll say that again. Attitude is also a position of the body, physically, proper to or implying an action or mental state. That's just another way of saying my attitude can be reflected in how I'm posturing myself. You can see how I'm thinking. You can see how I'm believing. Somebody's talking to you, you're like, if your mama was like man, she would say, why you got an attitude? Sometimes she wouldn't say, you just get smacked. And you know, why you smack me? I get, you had an attitude problem. So it's when attitude can be seen in the posture of even one's, one's body. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Attitude is also known as the orientation of an aircraft or a spacecraft relative to the direction of travel. The orientation of an aircraft or spacecraft relative to the direction of travel. So even mechanically speaking, one can look at that word attitude and understand that the positioning of an airplane or a spacecraft, the attitude is indicative of where that thing is going. If the attitude of a plane, we talked about this on Sunday, they have an attitude indicator on the inside of a plane, and some of you have seen pictures of it. It's a ball, and it kind of moves around like this. As the plane moves, it moves, and it has like these wings on it like that. Uh, and it's blue at the top and kind of orange or, or brownish at the bottom. And the bottom part is earth. The top part is the sky. And if your plane is face down, then you're going to see more brown. And you don't want to see that for very long. Uh, but if it's facing up, if the attitude of the plane is up, then you're going to see more blue on that ball, which you don't want to see that for too long either because eventually as you fly up too far in all planes, eventually your plane is going to do what you call stall. So it's important that depending on what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go, that you watch that attitude indicator to make sure you're oriented right. 
As a matter of fact, if you're flying through clouds, which you're not supposed to do for a long period of time, but if you're flying through clouds, or especially when you're in a storm, the only thing you have to let you know whether you're right side up is your attitude indicator. Believe it or not, it is very easy to be flying in a plane and fly, find yourself flying upside down, and people have done that and died because they didn't know how to use their instruments properly. As you watch that attitude indicator, not, you know, as you're turning and trying to dodge stuff and pulling up and down and stuff like that, eventually your plane can, can become disoriented and you'll be upside down, and all of a sudden, that attitude indicator will be telling you, listen, but all of a sudden, when you're pulling up, you're going down. And so everything is backwards all of a sudden. And the attitude indicator is what keeps you safe. The attitude indicator is what tells you which way to go. Another question tonight is, is what is your attitude indicator telling you? As I believe God, I will develop the right attitude. Believe God about what? About everything he says about who you are and what he's done. As I believe God, I will develop the attitude, which is the way of thinking that leads to proper positioning that points me in the right direction. That's what I'm defining attitude as based on the word. It's a way of thinking that leads to proper positioning that points me in the right direction. Now, what's the right direction? the direction that the Word of God points me into. And it's important you understand what that is because the Word of God is always going to direct you to do something. It's a four-letter word. It starts with an L. It ends with an E. You got a B right before the E. Yeah, love. Some of you are like, live, live. <laughs> the Word of God is always going to direct you to love. And so we as rulers should be developing an attitude or a way of thinking that leads to proper positioning in the word of God and that proper positioning is always going to point me in the right direction which is to love. This is the same attitude or the mind that Christ had. Let's look at this in a word. Go to, with me to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to start at verse 1 and we're going to look at this in the, uh, let's just look at it in the New Living Translation. Philippians 2, 1. It says, is there any encouragement from beginning, or sorry, from belonging to Christ? Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Keep going. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? That's a question you would have asked yourself. Is my heart tender and compassionate? Keep going. It says, then make me truly happy. This is Paul, remember, writing to the church um, of Philippi. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with who? Each other. Then he says what? Doing what? Loving one another. And working together with one mind and purpose. Verse three, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Now he's trying to teach them how to live like Jesus. He's trying to teach them how to be who they are. And he starts off saying, listen, don't be selfish, be humble, love each other, work together. Because this is the attitude that you need to have. Let's keep going. He says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. He said, listen, don't mean that you can't have your stuff together, but it got to be about other people too. Verse 5, you must, you must. He says all of this, and then he says, you must have the same, what's that word? You must have the same positioning of your mind. You have to have the same way of thinking. 
That's going to point you in all that right direction that I was just telling you. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Verse 6. Here's the attitude he had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He didn't just walk in his rights. I can't believe they're trying to kill me. I'm about to kill all y'all. You know who I am? I'm gonna call all, I could call all these angels, you know, and just zap all y'all. No, no, no. He, for him to do that would have been thinking of himself. Even though he was being done wrong, he still wouldn't think of himself. Verse 7. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position, there's that word, of a slave. Now we know that he wasn't technically a slave to sin because he was God. But he took on the form, you can leave it right there, good job guys, and leave it right there. No, no, uh, go back, go back where he was at. And he took on the form of somebody who was like a sinner because he took on the form of a human. And humans were slaves to sin. He gave up his rights and he came to earth because he had a job to do. Who are you in the story? You're the Jesus in the story. As he did, so should we. Oh, you save with your save, heir of God, Christ in you, maturing self. But there's work to do. The idea is not to take all of this and come and just sit in the church and keep it by ourselves. We got to give up some of these rights and some of these privileges, and we got to go out into this world, and we got to be like Christ. We got to be like Jesus. It says he was born of a human being. He, he went to the lower place because he had the ability, he had the power, he had the might to get it done. Don't be afraid to go to the lower place to get things done. Don't be afraid to go to the club when God tells you. Don't be afraid to go to the strip club, ladies, uh, when God tells you. Ladies. Pastor, I was just in here ministering. Uh, you know, some dude in the strip club. No, that's, that's what's, what's the uh, uh, Pastor Taffy's uh, program? Oh, Prestige. That's prestige. That's for the ladies. All the guys do is they just drive the cars, amen? They drive the ladies there. But, but somebody got to go in there. We can't say, oh, no, that's just because, you know, uh, they, they, that's that choice they're making. Don't be afraid to go to the, to the drug houses. Don't be afraid to go to the homeless shelters and to the, to the, street, into the streets where the homeless people are. Don't be afraid to go there giving up your privilege of, of good smell and good food and good this, that, and the other because, thank God, he's actually won the battle. Thank God he's actually already taken care of everything, but we got to be okay getting uncomfortable. You understand how uncomfortable it had to be for God to come to earth and then to put on a body? Oh my goodness, I, didn't, I don't think I've thought about it this deep before. But God came to earth, God came to earth and shoved himself into a body, limited himself in a body for you and I. The least I can do is get up on a Saturday and go out for an hour. But it just takes maturity. It takes a change of attitude. This ain't, this ain't just for children. Amen? It says that he was born in human, in, in a, as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled. That's what you thought you knew what humility was about. But this is what humbling is really about. Giving up privilege. Giving up right. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. He was willing to let them talk about him. He was willing to let them mistreat him. 
He was willing to let them beat him. He was even willing to let them kill him. This is the attitude of Christ that Paul just said we need to have. And this, guys, is as rulers. That's what makes it love is because you actually have right not to do any of it. But don't be misled. The only reason why you have right, the only reason why you have privilege, the only reason why you have power is because of grace. So for anybody to get stuck in their privilege, their righteousness, their inheritance, their sonship, and then move to do nothing would be to not even appreciate what grace did for you. To withhold because I'm enjoying the blessing. And then to not go out and share it with another when that's what your brother did for you when that's what your Savior did for you, when that's what your God provided your Father for you, it's like the sibling who got the popsicle that you gave him, and then the other sibling comes along and says, can I have half, and it was only one, and then they say, no, it's mine. Any good parent gonna snatch that popsicle from that kid? <laughs> and then give it to the other one. But God in his love, he doesn't snatch salvation from you. He continues to minister to you, trying to change the way you think so that you'll share the power and the privilege and the popsicle that he's given to you. Share your popsicle with somebody this weekend. He said he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Verse 9. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. Verse 10, that, the, at, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. Verse 11, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you were ever wondering how your attitude should be, you just found the answer. I should have the attitude of a servant. I should have an attitude as a ruler of one who would sacrifice. I have to change my way of thinking or allow my way of thinking to be changed by God so that my thinking will no longer lead me to acts of selfishness, acts of self-preservation, but instead, an action, instead seeing acts of love coming out of me. How do I know they're acts of love, Archie? Because they're gonna be acts and thoughts that want to serve others. It's very simple. Acts of love are acts that want to serve others. Michael Smith uh, was doing a great message the other night, and we're going to, and it's so funny because it's where we're headed. And I was like, man, this is where we're headed. And he was talking about um, Mosaic Law of, uh, that deals with uh, love, the law of love, uh, that's, and that's the one that's written on our heart. And then you also have the law of Christ. And one talks about doing no harm, which is definitely important, but the law of Christ doesn't just talk about doing no harm. It actually talks about not doing harm, but also seeking to do others good. It's written on all of our hearts to do no harm, but then if you want to please the Father, please the Father, you got to get into believing what Christ did and then following the law of Christ. And the law of Christ talks about bearing one another's burdens. So I'm just not, not doing you wrong, because I cannot do you wrong and still walk right past you when you're in need. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to steal from you. I'm not going to envy. I'm not going to uh, commit adultery. I'm not going to do the, the big 10. And I could be in moral line with Moses' version of the law of love as well as the law of love that existed before that. I could be totally in line with that, but then see you about to go to hell, see you in need, and walk right past you. Because I ain't got time. 
And how many of you guys know that's not what Christ will want? The law of Christ talks about having an attitude and a way of thinking and a mindset that then leads you to proper action to say, I am not going to do you harm, and also I am going to seek to be a blessing to you so that you will be empowered to prosper. And that starts with leading people to Christ. Amen. Amen. And then once that's done, there's some natural things that also needs to happen. If they need money, James talks about it. If they need money, if they need food, if they need clothes, I'm there by the will of God and the power of God to help meet that need. If you understand that, say amen. amen. So we have to have a ruler's attitude. This ruler's attitude is Christ's attitude. Right rulers are lovers, lovers of God and his word. They're lovers of his truth and his direction. They're lovers of his people. Right rulers are servants of God and his people. The Bible says that the people rejoice when the righteous do what? When they rule. Look at this, Proverbs 29, 2. Proverbs 29, 2. You've been saying this scripture and reading it all this time, and this is what it's talking about. Proverbs 29, 2. Y'all got it, do I need to turn to it? Okay, I'm going to turn to it. Sometimes it's good to turn, amen? You don't forget what stuff is. In the King James, it says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. The NLT up there says, when the godly are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked are in power, they groan. The Amplified says, when the uncompromisingly righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked man rules, the people groan and sigh. All this complaining that's happening and groaning and sighing and everything in our nation right now because the, 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 the folks are waiting for righteous folks to rule. Not good folks, not people who say they're good folks. I'm talking about rulers. But the rulers, we got to come out the churches. And we got to get involved. We got to stop talking about the people of old and the preachers of old who did it. And now it's time for us to do it now. I praise God, thank God for what Martin Luther King did, but, but it's time now to move on. Amen. Amen. What do you mean it's time to move on? It's time for you to be the next Martin Luther King. This is the day of, uh, I forgot what year, but the anniversary of uh, the I Have a Dream speech. Today is. And he was a preacher, a Christian, who didn't stop at the natural pulpit, but who went out in the community and he was flawed, so don't sit up there and start thinking about all the flaws and all that type, whatever. He got out there and did something. And it caused change. That speech put pressure in the political world and caused the Civil Rights Act to move forward. And as a result, if you got black or brown skin in here, trust me, it worked out well for us. And, 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 and therefore, it worked out well for everybody. But that was a preacher, that was a Christian who got out and started with the message of, and what was his message? Nonviolence and love. Let them beat you. Let them spit on you. Let them talk about you. But respond with love. Wow, sounds like somebody we just read about in Philippians too. Let them talk about you. Let them do you wrong. But respond with love. Because he understood 1 Corinthians 13 that even though you can speak with the tongue of angels, there was something not greater than love. There was nothing greater than love. He understood 1 Corinthians 13, 8, that love never fails. 
That was a man who had God on the inside, who was mature enough to lead with the attitude that Christ had. And it changed our world. That was one man. What would happen if the entire body of Christ stood up and operated as he did in this earth? Not seeking anything else from God, but understanding we have all of him. And now that we have all of him, it is time to operate as he did in this earth. Taking on the mindset, the positioning that Christ had and saying, I don't need anybody to do another thing for me because my God has done it all. And now I am seeking to do good and to be a blessing to everybody I come in contact with. I can't walk past a wrong and not declare it right in the name of God. My God, what would happen if we changed our attitudes? Go with me to John chapter 7, verse 16. Are you getting anything out of this? John 7, 16. And we'll uh, look at this in a New Living uh, translation. See, this is all God is looking for. He's looking for us to, to come into our position and to be who we are. John 7, 16 says, So Jesus told them, My message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely, merely my own. Verse 18. Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves. Moses gave you the law, but none of you obey it. That was interesting that he said that. When I read this, I literally bust out laughing. Jesus is talking to, to folks, Jewish folks who, or who are supposed to be living by this law. These are religious people he's talking to. He said, y'all tripping about the law, y'all don't even do it. He said, in fact... You're trying to kill me. What happened to thou shall not kill? <laughs> That's what he's saying. He's like, you're literally trying to murder me. Verse 20. Oh, sorry. The crowd replied, and here they go justifying. This is religious folk justifying. You're demon possessed. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, and you were amazed. Verse 22, but you work on the Sabbath too when you obey Moses' law of circumcision. Remember on the Sabbath, you weren't supposed to do nothing. He said, y'all tripping because I worked a miracle on the Sabbath, but y'all break the Sabbath yourselves. It says, actually, keep going, this tradition of circumcision began with the patriarchs long before the law of Moses. So circumcision and, and all that, remember that was back with Abraham. And so he's like, oh, I, I want to get ahead of myself. Verse 24, <laughs> he says, uh, sorry, thank you. For if the correct time for circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and you do it. So as not to break the law of Moses, so why would you be angry with me for healing a man, or, uh, keep going, on the Sabbath? Uh, verse 24. He said, look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. And here's what he was saying. He was like, listen, you guys had the, the rule or the law that you got from Abraham that you're supposed to circumcise your kid, your son. But you also have this other rule that says, from the law, you're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. But if it's time for you and you're supposed to circumcise your son and it falls on the Sabbath, you do it anyway. So he was telling them, listen, you're breaking the law that you're tripping about. So he was saying, listen, 
I'm here to set all this right. I'm here to give you understanding. I'm here to get you out of this religion and to get you into relationship with me. But here you are coming after me. And all of this started off with what said at the beginning, he was only doing what God told him to do, and he was bringing truth, and he was bringing enlightenment to people. And that's what you and I are here to do. People don't even know sometimes their hypocrisy. They don't even know sometimes their error. But the truth is inside of you and I. And we got to be willing to show up and do what Jesus did. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. Yeah, let's go here and then we'll get ready to close up. So at the end of the day, if I'm going to have this right attitude, I have to come to the conclusion that I have to believe God. Because you hear all of this, and I know you know you should have the right attitude, and you should have the mind of Christ or the attitude of Christ, but you should be coming to the same conclusion I had, which was, okay, well, how do I do that? And it's by knowing what the will of God is. And God's will is simply that we believe. Let's look at a few scriptures on this. It says, John, uh, go to John 5, 24. And we're going to go through these really fast, so y'all just be ready to bat. John 5, 24. It says... They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from, uh, is that the beginning of that scripture? Yeah, there you go. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and do what? Believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death to life. So the beginning of this thing is, do you believe? God's God wants you to believe him. Uh, go to Matthew 21, verse 22. Matthew 21, 22. It says, you can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and what's going to happen? It's going to happen. Keep going. You can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. Am I believing? Am I having faith? John 6, 35. If I want to see results, God's will is that I just believe. John 6, 35. It says, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be what? Hungry again. If I'm going to come to Jesus and receive from him, how many of you guys know i got to believe? i got to believe that he is the source. But if I don't believe, guess what? I'm not going to him. Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. There we go. And it is impossible to please God without what? Faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must do what? Believe what now? Why is it important to believe that God exists? Again, if I tell you I got a million dollars for you and you want to receive that million dollars but you don't believe that Archie Collins exists, are you going to get that million dollars? No, because you think it's a scam. When you don't believe the source exists, in this day and age, you believe it's a scam. There are many people in their hearts of hearts that believe this whole Christianity thing is a scam. You, can, you just log into your social media and see that. I don't believe in God. Well, then you won't get nothing from him. But he definitely exists and he definitely loves you. He says you have to believe that God exists and that he, keep going, rewards those who sincerely seek him. That's what we were just talking about in the beginning. As you seek him, you'll find everything you need. Now that you've sought him, you have it. Do you believe it? Because if you believe it, then you got it. And if you got it, then that's the end of it. 
Amen? Somebody says, why is this important? Again, this is all the cubes that you need to fill in the requirement of having the right attitude. I don't receive nothing from God if I don't believe it. I'm talking about me personally. Doesn't matter how saved I am, it doesn't matter how anointed I am, and this, that, and other. If I get into doubt and unbelief, then I don't receive. Not because it's not there, not because it's not available, but because I don't hear him in his direction. Did you know it's possible to be a believer and still have unbelief? Let me show you somebody who had that. Mark 9, 23. And uh, let's look at this in the message, Mark 9, 23. We're going to read verses 23 and 24. It's possible to believe and then still have unbelief. So this is where you have to be careful as a Christian who's a believer. Mark 9, uh, 23, and then we'll go up to verse 24. It says, Jesus said, if there are no ifs among who? So he's talking about believers. If there are no ifs among believers, anything, anything can happen. Verse 24, no sooner were the words out of his mouth that the father cried, then I believe, help me with my, King James Version says unbelief, message says help me with my doubts. He believed in Jesus, and that's why he brought the, the need, I think he brought his kid to Jesus, and, and he needed the help that he needed, so he believed that far, but then he still had doubt. And that's what a lot of us look like. We, we're believers and we're saved, but we still have doubt, so then we don't take on the mind of Christ and go and operate as he did here on earth. It's not confusion that's stopping you in the sense of, I don't know what God wants me to do, it's doubt. It's unbelief that's clogging up your receiver and you're having a hard time receiving direction from the Holy Spirit. Some of us have received direction from the Holy Spirit, but we're doubting whether it will really work, and so we're just standing still. He's already told you what to do. He's already told you where to go and how to go. The question is, is are you going to believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, Jesus believed that God was. And he also believed that God was a rewarder. That's what happened, wasn't it? When Jesus did all that it said there in Philippians, God did what? Promoted him, raised him up, if you will. Made his name the name that every other name had to come up under. There was reward that came on the other side of that obedience because Jesus had the right attitude. You've been looking for all this time for when is my reward coming from God? When is the manifestation gonna happen? When you believe. Because when you believe, you have the right attitude. And when you have the right attitude, or the right mindset, or the right positioning of that mind, then you will obey the will of your Father. And on the other side of that obedience, you will find the manifestation of his grace. It's on the other side of the door. It's on the other side of his voice. It's on the other side of his will. And that's why so many of us are stuck at this child level with our inheritance, with Christ in us, but not receiving full manifestation, it's not because it's not there, it's because we are not maturing and doing what God is saying to do in this earth, which is love his people in whatever specific way he tells you, and so we're not seeing the full manifestation of his grace in our lives. You're seeing childlike, help me Holy Spirit, childlike provision. You're seeing provision from him for child. Because, oh, Lord, help me. He said, because you're doing work at the childlike level. Kids don't need all the resources adults have. Adults got bills. <laughs> adults have other things they got to do. I hope you're seeing what I'm saying. 
as you step out into what he tells you to do, into the ministries, into the businesses, into the political realm, into the, into the jobs and, and the relationships and all the stuff he's calling you to do, it's going to take greater resources to do that. And you're looking for all these resources now when you're not fully in the mindset that you need to be in and therefore you're not fully in the activity that he's called you to do. So you don't, he got the resources for you, but it's, it's for the mature work that he's called you to do. Not the childlike work. My kids were three, four. They didn't, they didn't need as much as they need now. And then when, when thank God, when the last one moving out soon, I, I think uh, later when she graduate, and, uh, and, then, and then she's going to have new resources that are going to be made available to her for the new level of life that she's going to be at. But don't continue to operate at a childlike level in your mindset because then you're going to have childlike results. And you're going to have childlike resources. And you're wondering, why am I always financially broke? I got to ask you, are you doing what he's called you to do? Because I know you're a believer and you're saved, so prosperity should not be an issue. Amen. Now, again, this isn't to condemn you. This is to help you identify what's going on so you can go ahead and get this, the line hooked back up so the flow will be right. But if you're trying to do something he didn't tell you to do or you're not doing something he told you to do, then there's a disconnect. Hook that thing up the way he said to hook it up and do what he's called you to do and do what he's told you to do and watch the flow. As a matter of fact, I believe it talks about us having an overflow and abundance. When did Jesus run out of money? When did Jesus fall short of power? When did Jesus find himself without a house? He even had a place to lay his head when he was first born and his parents were basically immigrants and homeless. When did Jesus have lack is my point. Man, why? Because he had this mindset. And he believed, and he was always doing the will of his Father. Church, I submit to you today that we have to mature, and we have to begin to adjust our attitude so that we can have the attitude Christ had. And all of that's going to be founded on, do I believe God? And I'm talking about a belief that is free of doubt, that is free of fear that it won't happen, that is free of fear or worry that it won't work out. You have to now be convinced that if he told me to do it, it's done. If he told me to do it, it's provided for. If he told me to do it, it's already worked out. If he told me to do it, I'm already victorious. If he told me to do it, it's already in abundance. If he told me to do it, it's already a full supply. If he told me to do it, it is settled, it is finished, all is well, I believe it, I doubt my doubts, and I doubt it won't work out. I know all is well because he told me to do it, and I believe him, and he's going to reward me at the end of the day, and I'm not even looking for the reward, but I know it's there. Why? Because he told me to do it. And that is where we have to now fix our attitude and allow the Holy Spirit Allow the word of God to always be the source that adjusts us if our attitude ever gets off. Do you receive that today? Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Well, amen. I don't know if anybody's uh, heading up here tonight, but uh, I just want to pray over that word that we shared on tonight. Father God, we just thank and praise you right now for the word that we've shared. And Father, I thank you right now for your wisdom, your guidance based on what we've heard tonight. I thank you, Lord, that you are the one 
who we follow. You are the source of the direction, and we are obedient to your word. Help us, Holy Spirit, develop the attitude, the mind of Christ. Help us be humble. Help us be willing to set aside our privilege to serve you. We commit our will. We commit our will. We commit our will to your way. In Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. 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 Well, come on, give God a hand clap of praise for that. Melissa, somebody coming up? Somebody coming up? Amen. Well, it's now time for giving, so let's give God a hand clap of praise. If you need to offer an envelope, the ushers will be happy to serve you. And again, this is, this is another example of just doing what the Father says. What is he telling you to do? We understand that, you know, uh, about seed time and harvest, and we understand about giving, but I want you to also understand about the blessing. You're, you're, you're blessed. But now will you take what you've been blessed with, and again, it's, it's the same thing we just talked about at Humble, ourselves and then give now i'm gonna be careful how i say this but if god is telling you to give and it's a sacrifice then still give if god is telling you to give and it's a little uncomfortable then still give because i'm gonna tell you what if i'm not willing to give of my finances which is the result of my work which is a part of me I'm not going to be willing to give that, 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 that self to his will and his call. The money is the easy thing. Start with that. Lord, I'm going to worship you. That's what that word really means, by the way. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to, sacri- I'm going to serve you with this. Somebody, should we, should we tithe or not? They were tithing before it was even a law. It's a way of honoring God. Abraham gave a tenth of all that he had just to honor God. And again, it's, it's back to maturity. If I'm questioning giving him a dime on a dollar, then am I, am I really focusing on the right thing? No, the question is, is how much do you honor him? And again, back to what is he telling you to do? Not what is guilt telling you to do. Not what is condemnation telling you to do. Not what is necessity telling you to do. Ooh, I, I need a new car, so I'm going I'm 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 to get this and I'm going to get a new car. No, new car is yours. You'll discover new car on the path of his will for your life. But to be on that path requires obedience. And he may say, give the $20 or the $200 or the $2,000, whatever he tells you to give, he may say to do that as you're on that path. And as you disobey, you begin to get off the path that has what you need on it. Is that making sense? The money isn't going to manifest the new car. The money and giving the money and being obedient is going to keep you on his path of his will for your life. And if you start becoming disobedient, you get off the path, and that's why the car don't show up. It's manifested, but you're going to run into it through your obedience. Does that make sense? Your dollars are not magic. (laughs) But what they are, when you give them, they're worship. And they're telling God, you're more important than this. And I'm sowing it on today in obedience to your will. So never give again out of guilt. Never give again out of condemnation or shame or fear. My old my my old pastor, my old church told me if I didn't if I didn't give at least this, then I was going you know be broke the rest of my life. That's just not in the Bible. It's not true. What if what if I got to pay my mortgage tomorrow? Well, what is God telling you to do? Pay my mortgage. Pay your mortgage. What are you being deep about it? He might tell you, pay your mortgage tomorrow and then sow some sacrificial, crazy, amazing gift on Sunday. I don't know. I'm not your God. 
you need to have a relationship with him. And as you learn how to trust him, giving will become just a reflex of your love and your obedience to him. But some of us may not be there yet, and I don't want you beating yourself up. Amen? You may still be developing or in the process of learning how to be mature like that and trust him. So trust him with where, where, where you are. Lord, you know, you know where I'm at. What you want me to do? He'll talk to you right there. Girl, go and get that 50 cent and just leave it alone. And trust me with the 50 cents. That's all I got to give, Lord. You know that's what I can do. Well, if it was good enough for the widow with her two mites, pop your two coins in there and, and, and be done with it. Trust God. Don't you walk out of here in condemnation because you saw somebody else stuffing cash in an envelope and you watched them the whole time they licked the envelope and wrote their stuff and you was like, I, I wish I could give that. Don't you do that. Don't condemn yourself and compare yourself like that. You trust God. He's honoring that 50 cents as much as he's honoring that 5,000. Amen. Amen. Did you hear what I said? Now you trust him. Amen? Amen? So if you're given by your phone, you can hold it up. If you're given by the envelope, uh, you can hold it, and we're just going to pray over it. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the seeds that are sown. We declare and agree that they are already blessed. And we thank you that the seed has enough in it to get the harvest. And we declare and decree, in Jesus' name, it's done. Amen. Amen. Usher.